Hello, I'm Manoj Karmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. I hope you're enjoying viewing our videos. If you are, then do remember to subscribe to this channel. In this upcoming video, Dr. George Feigl from the Witten University in Germany is going to discuss with us the functional anatomy of the cervical spine and paravertebral region as it is relevant for injection techniques in pain medicine. Enjoy the upcoming video. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the inconvenience about that uh, because I started without a computer and now I got my computer. I see already the uh, presentation, so you should see it now, hopefully. Yeah. Um, I just want to give you a short impression about the, um, the landmarks, which are so important if you palpate just before uh, going for uh, the ultrasound itself. You know that you get the occipital bone with the external occipital protuberance. You get the mastoid process, which will be also a very important part for one of the nerve fibers reaching the occipital area. And of course, you see the transverse process of the, the atlas, which is the most prominent part in this, uh, just close to the uh, mastoid process. And of course, then the spinous processes of C2 to C7, where you know that regularly C2 is, uh, can be not that well palpable, causing, uh, caused by the high body mass index of patients. Um, so this is a very important thing and also the uh, different way how the, uh, how the uh, vertebral spines and ver the vertebra, the cervical vertebra are look like. Uh, you get this low doses, you all know it, of course, then you get the spinous processes which are divided and especially covered by the nuchal ligament and also the superficial uh, parts of the uh, neck muscles. And these are really partially enormous concerning the, uh, their extension and also development. So this is really entirely covered uh, by muscular parts and also, of course, ligamentous and tendinous parts, as you will see by the sections later on. Most important is the um, vertebra from its surface, as already Shankar uh, showed really, really well uh, and incredibly. Uh, you see the surface concerning the spinous processes divided and then turning this curve to the articular processes where the um, dorsal branch will pass by. And of course, additionally, then the two tuberculars of the uh, transverse process, where the posterior one is the real transverse process and the anterior tubercular is a, re uh, a re reminiscent of a rib, uh, especially also then a problem concerning the anterior tubercular of the seventh uh, cervical vertebra. Additionally, you see from the lateral view of this vertebra, these two tuberculars forming a real uh, groove in between, which is um, used by the spinal nerve and the ventral branch of the spinal nerve. Uh, and this spinal uh, nerve branch has to pass the vertebral artery dorsally. And additionally, there is the uh, arise in the origin of this dorsal branch, which is very close to the uh, intervertebral foramen. So the spinal nerve trunk itself will has, uh, have only a very short, short uh, extension of not, not more than two, three millimeters in the area of the cervical spine. Um, so if you, if you keep on going, you see then the seventh, uh, which is also changing a little bit, because you get no division of the spinal process. But anyway, you uh, also an, a change of the physial joint position and orientation. Uh, because in the cervical spine, you get more, let's say it like that, a more a little bit oblique frontal plane. And then it has to turn really in a frontal plane because you are in the area where it's changing to the thoracic spine. Additionally, you see on this uh, vertebra, this reminiscent of the anterior tubercle, which can be developed to a rib and enlarge the area and then change your um, ultrasound image at all. 
Additionally, you have this vertebral artery, as already was mentioned before, especially in the area of the um, atlas, where it has to turn around, but also gets a very important topography in between the atlas and the axis. So you should have, ever be aware of this artery in this area, what you will see later on on dissection images. Um, when you go to the ligamentous part, you see the nuchal ligament, which is uh, taken away. And then you see the um, plantar occipital membrane, the posterior one, and also the flavor ligament. And over there, the um, capsule of the two capofusial joints. And you see this small groove, which already Shankar mentioned, where the spine of the dorsal branch will pass by and dividing into the different branches, medial and lateral branch. Anyway, it's more important that there is the dorsal branch and if an injection will be um, positioned over there, uh, you will reach these nerve branches, of course, as well. So you get this membrane, you get the Atlanta occipital uh, joint and the Atlanta axial joint in this area. See already the trichopophysial joint, which is uh, more or less uh, different to the others in the cervical spine and then the trichopophysial joints of C2, 3, and C3, 4. If we take now uh, the dorsal view again, and also the lateral view, you see this high extension of the nuchal ligament, and also, of course, in the area of the facet joints, where you get over here this laminar part, not very much space. It's, it's more or less over here a huge gap, but uh, remember that we have the lower doses, so it will be or, or always a little bit less than uh, showed on um, such images as are taken out of chromatoids. The facet joint already mentioned, they are more or less in a oblique horizontal to transverse plane. So you see, you really get the covering by the um, um, so inferior articular process of the adjacent more cranial vertebra. So it's really a covering. So to get into the um, so, uh, into the joint uh, cavity, it's not that easy. You really have to see it quite clearly and then get or insert. But nevertheless, if you really want to make a pain therapy, it's enough to be around because all the capsule innovation is coming from external from this medial branch, which is passing in this area. So you can see the facet joints over here, also with some uh, labia over there, which is uh, entering inside. And of course, um, this is something what you can uh, make visible by ultrasound with special positioning. What is also very important in this area is the uncovertebral uh, joint, and of course, the topography to the vertebral artery, which is running uh, cranially with the transversal part, uh, in the, inter, uh, in the in, uh, transversal foramen. Um, then you see this turning point at level of the atlas and to reach the at, uh, to the atlas very laterally. So you have really a curved course of the vertebral artery in the level of axis and atlas, which have to be kept in mind, especially if you're going to uh, reach the area of the uh, ox uh, greater occipital nerve. The topography of the spinal nerve with the arterial artery is already told. You can see it, it's ventrally positioned, the artery passed dorsally by the spinal nerve. And then you can see quite uh, well over here already this splitting of the uh, spinal nerve uh, into the ventral branch and the dorsal branch, which has to turn around the articular process and gets its topography to the two upper physical joint. So nevertheless, what you see when you put uh, position uh, your probe laterally and you can see the two tubercle, um, the dorsal branch has already left at this moment. So what you see is only the ventral ramus anymore, which is arising. And unfortunately, of course, you do not get this wonderful, lovely spines and the vertebras, but more or less uh, the, the pathological parts. And this should give you an impression what you might see on ultrasound, 
with the surfaces not very smooth and plain, but more or less like uh, like, like different osteophytes are uh, being developed in this area and make a little bit uh, irritation concerning the surfaces of the bone. What about the muscular parts now? As I already mentioned, they are covering the entire area of the uh, uh, cervical spine. You see different layers. And the different layers are, of course, the superficial two muscle layers, which is consisting of the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, followed by the splenius capitis muscle, which is going more laterally, but very important for the course of the uh, greater occipital nerve. And of course, for the lesser occipital nerve. Um, then, more in the depth, it's the semi spinalis capitis, which is running really straight cranially. And then, in the depth, you find the short muscles of the neck. Um, these are already perforated, partially perforated by the nerves, reaching the occipital area. And you can see over here the occipital artery. Then the lesser occipital nerve, which has a very distinct course, very close to the sternocleidal mastoid, and you will see him on uh, cross sections later on, and the greater occipital nerve. Both of them are deriving from the second uh, cervical um, segment uh, of the spinal cord. And the only difference is that the greater occipital nerve is the dorsal branch, or let's say corresponding to the dorsal branch of C2 segment, and the lesser occipital nerve is part of the cervical plexus, so part of a ventral ramus. Uh, anyway, both are coming from the same segment. So this is a very important information for you, that one of these is always the um, more powerful one and the more uh, important one for the occipital region. What does this mean? If the greater occipital nerve is, this, is a small one, developed very tinily, you get the huge lesser occipital nerve and other way around. So this is a very important thing you have to keep in mind concerning also a block technique in the cervical spine area, especially of the greater occipital nerve. So uh, and another one is the third occipital nerve, which used to be also one part to reach the occipital area. Unfortunately, um, we cannot really uh, tell you about the, the frequency running up over there because mainly our, our students are faster than we are in this area for the dissections. Um, so you can see also going to Prometo is the different and nerve fibers of the greater occipital nerve gone, and then the long, which is the less occipital nerve. And then um, in the dorsal part, you can see also the dorsal branches with the third, fourth, and, and so on, uh, dorsal branches of the cervical spinal cord segments. So let's take a look now on dissections. As you can see, the first layer with the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidal muscle, and then the splenius capitis underneath, and then the nerve fibers in this area too. So what you can get over here is the occipital artery reaching the occipital area, turning around and is covered by the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Then you get the great occipital nerve really running obliquely from medial to lateral. And this is very strange because you can make the visibility of the uh, infraoblique capitis muscle uh, but it turned around very laterally. So you see, oh, there might be a strange course of this nerve. So underneath, you will have the surprise. And of course, the splenius capitis with the lesser occipital, uh, third occipital nerve and the lesser occipital nerve, which has a close relation to the dorsal margin of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Imagine now also the vari variability in this area where you have a very close relationship of the trapezius and the sternocleidomastoid muscle because they are coming from the same myotomas, which means they can really cover up the entire uh, region uh, because they might fuse in this area. So don't be uh, afraid or don't be surprised if you get one really huge muscular plane in the superficial layer in the first layer. Anyway, you see, the two nerve fibers greater and lesser occipital nerve, which has over here a so-called ansa occipitalis 
which means they fuse together and they also uh, give fibers to the other nerve, uh, the other nerve, which means they are really great and little brother. Um, if we put away now the trapezius, you see the uh, splenius capitis and underneath this dense connective fiber tissues, uh, which are covering the semispinalis capitis. It's on the other way in the right uh, image. We put this dense connective tissue fibers away. Still the, the great occipital nerve is running medially and then it's turning over here. This is the turning point. So at the medial margin of the splenius capitis, you see it's going, turning around and then going into the depth uh, underneath the semispinalis to go laterally. So if we go now to the depth and put all away the muscle fibers, you will reach then the two capophysial joints and then these um, short muscles of the neck area, which is over here, the infer oblique capitis muscle. I'm sorry, I put the Latin terms also into because some of the uh, textbooks might give you these um, um, expressions or terms. Then you see uh, there is also the obliquus capitis supra and the two rectus muscles. Uh, they are forming over there a triangle which, which is called the suboccipital triangle, important for the first dorsal branch, which is the suboccipital nerve, innovating all these short muscle fibers. And then if you take now the course of the uh, greater occipital nerve, you find this special nerve over here. And uh, this is something which is quite strange because you see a very straight course of the, the great occipital nerve, which doesn't confirm our dissections. So you see sometimes the, um, the images of uh, or the drawings of uh, textbooks or, or atlases are not that correct because this is not a correct um, course. The course should be a little bit more to the medial part and then turning again back to lateral uh, as you already saw it in the dissections. So anyway, this is the most important area where the, um, where the greater occipital nerve is turning around underneath the obliquus capitis inferior. So you might have, uh, might see the greater occipital nerve twice. First, deep to the obliquus capitis inferior, and secondly, you see uh, a dot superficial to it. And as uh, Jean-Claude already said, you have to go superficially. And this is something which is the most important information in this area. Anyway, be aware, there are also many vessels around this uh, uh, so-called uh, venous plexus in this area, and also some small arteries passing by, but with ultrasound, you can uh, easily detect them and have no problems at all. Another dissections of this neck area where you see this turning point of the greater occipital nerve and then very laterally the arter uh, occipital artery reaching this area again. So you have to take this oblique muscle and then you see this turning point of the greater occipital nerve and then superficial to the muscle itself, you find this nerve fiber. Again, over here, you see, uh, this is uh, the third occipital nerve, the great occipital nerve with this medial course and then going laterally. And this is something what we find really very frequently, this straight direct course cranially, I cannot um, confirm that often. So concerning the suboccipital nerve, now you see that you find this nerve fiber in the suboccipital triangle, unfortunately, very, very close to the artery, to the vertebral artery. Uh, so you should consider if you make an injection over there for concerning proprioception, because uh, neck pain might be also uh, caused by this nerve, um, you should be aware that the artery is passing by. If you're lucky, you get this bony ossification, which is called ponticulus, in this area, and then you'll be you're quite safe because you cannot pierce the uh, bone over there that easily. Um, again, the, the, another dissection with this turning point. So this means this is the most important area concerning our um, dorsal branches quarterly to it. Um, you might find 
the nerve fibers over here. And you see the third occipital nerve now in this small groove turning around the articular processes. You see over here, this is the trichopophysial joint opened. And then underneath, really cold out to it very close, you see the nerve uh, turning around. So reaching this area. And this is the small groove you saw in the ultrasound images. So I can really confirm this course and a very uh, a good area to reach this nerve in, uh, in this area again. So you see again, this uh, greater and less occipital nerve and then the two coprophysial joints. Okay, <clears throat> again, the course of the third occipital nerve would not uh, change at all concerning the other um, dorsal branches. Um, and you see it's quite a network over there. Um, no exception, no exceptions can be made. So it might be also an opportunity, a possibility that the third occipital nerve might um, give some connections to the great occipital nerve, uh, and also the great occipital nerve might send some small fibers uh, going going to the caudal uh, segmental areas. Okay, so now let's go back to the dorsal and ventral rami. Um, you get this ventral rami uh, passing through this groove in between the anterior and posterior uh, posterior and then uh, the dorsal rami in this small groove. And you can see this is now also very important information that you do not have fibers going to the cranial uh, to the physical joint, but also the caudal. This would be absolutely in. Um, um, well, the same way how the trichopophysial joints are innovated in the lumbar uh, spine, as you know it, which was confirmed and also described by uh, Nicola Bogduk quite, quite well. Um, unfortunately, it is a little bit of difference uh, concerning uh, the topography of the nerve to the bone itself. In the lumbar spine, as you will see later on, you have a really um, and the ligamentous structures, a structure which is um, really uh, getting the nerve to the bone and over in the cervical spine, you do not have this fixation by a ligament, um, unfortunately. So you see this turning around in this area. And uh, again, in the dissections, you will have this small groove and then the fibers going up cranially and cordially. So if we take now a cross-section as an example, <clears throat> this is a very uh, high level cross-section of C2. You can see over here, this is the obliquus capitis inferior muscle, and then uh, the nerve fibers turning around. And these are the nerve fibers of the occip great occipital nerve. So in between, as you can see quite easily, uh, the same is spinalis and uh, uh, splenius capitis underneath. And this is this, um, really lever and the, the space where you might do the injection or do the injection without being too uh, deep to it. And the second nerve, as you can see in um, uh, image, is the ventral branch over here. And this is the lesser occipital nerve. As you can see on this image too, we have the lesser occipital nerve and the greater. And watch out the uh, lesser occipital nerve in this area. You have the sternocleidomastoid muscle, you have the splenius capitis muscle, this is the trapezius, and really in the at the dorsal margin, not always really dorsal to it, but more or less a little bit covered by it, you find the lesser occipital nerve in a very constant position in this area. Um, <clears throat> to make uh, a clear identification, you uh, might go with the probe portally, and then the nerve should go underneath the sternocleidomastoid and more ventrally. So this is a clear identification of the topographic uh, topography of the lesser occipital nerve. And as I already told you, it's a very important nerve that is concurring with, with uh, the greater occipital nerve, and therefore you should be aware that if you do not have an effective block in the area of, for the great occipital nerve, you can sniper the lesser one too. So um, what about the dorsal branch itself? 
uh, if you more, get more quarterly at level, for example, C4, where you get the bifurcation of the carotid artery, you see over here this turning around. And this is the dorsal branch reaching also the nerve, um, the parts. And but, uh, you can imagine how this might be the medial branch and the lateral branch is going somewhere into the uh, muscle fibers of the neck area. So <clears throat> you already get over here uh, a bifurcation. Anyway, this is one of the dorsal branches uh, going dorsally. And to see the turning around uh, uh, at the level of the articular processes, the lamina again, and the spinous process, which is developed. So quite huge distance. Anyway, um, one important information concerning the turning point in which space you are. And this is something what you have to keep in mind, uh, especially concerning injection of uh, large volumes. I'm playing a little bit now the Advocatus Diaboli. Um, if you be aware that there is the pre-vertebral fascia, you are in the same space underneath. This is called the pre-vertebral space, which is continuing to the epidural space. So um, a position very close to the articular processes uh, might be a certain risk uh, if you get the wrong direction of the needle, for example, that it might spread epidurally. So be aware of that and uh, be always a little bit in caution, uh, caution that uh, it might be then uh, a dramatic change uh, of your patient's health. Um, so spread is sometimes uh, a little bit surprising and especially if you have uh, needle directions which are more or less eventually and medially directed uh, you might risk a spread into the epidural space via the intervertebral foramen. Um, this is again also confirmed over here by the eventual rami going out of the uh, brachial plexus and to see over here uh, the dorsal branch, oops, the dorsal branch over here, uh, which is just uh, has left the ventral branch of the spinal nerve and is turning around this area. So very quite a small one at this level. What does this mean? Uh, they are not always the same size, of course, because sometimes you get the different sizes concerning also the innovation uh, quality uh, and, and some are larger ones and some are the smaller ones. So that's unfortunately the variability, which is um, in each person different. So a lot of anatomy, a lot of dissections, a lot of cross sections, as you saw it. And at this level, really, uh, I want to give you the anatomically, not advice, but recommendation. Be aware of complications and never open the box of Pandora. Otherwise, you will get the monster out of it. Thank you very much.